Hello, everyone, and thank you for logging in to our webinar today titled Shining Light on Nanomaterials with Optically Coupled Electron Microscopy. I am very, very happy to introduce today our speaker, Dr. Dane Swerer. Dane is an Arnold O. Beckman postdoctoral fellow in the chemical sciences, currently working with Professor Jennifer Dion in the Material Science and Engineering Department at Stanford University. He received his Bachelor and Master of Science in Chemistry from Drexel University in 2014 and then moved to Rice University to pursue his PhD where he was an NSF graduate research fellow working in the laboratory for nanophotonics under the mentorship of Professor Naomi Hollis. At Rice, Dane developed the antenna reactor concept for efficiently driving chemical reactions using light and built novel spectroscopy tools for monitoring chemical transformations. In July of 2019, he moved to Stanford, where his work has focused on developing new methods for observing nanoscale optical processes in the TEM. His long-term research interests include the development of novel nanophotonic materials that contribute to improved global health and sustainability, as well as the investigation of novel spectroscopy and imaging tools that correlate atomic structure to function. We're very happy to have Dane with us today. Um, just before we start uh, the presentation, um, Dane, if we can show the next slide, please. Uh, if you have any questions or uh, during the webinar, please submit them uh, using the question panes um, that you see um, on your GoToWebinar uh, window. Uh, we will try to answer as many as possible at the end of Dane's presentation. And if we don't have time to answer them during the limited time that we have today um, live, we will uh, get back to you with answers to your questions uh, via email after the webinar. If you also have any issues during the, uh, the presentation, please let us know um, and we will try to resolve them. Um, yeah, uh, we, uh, we are very happy to have everyone here. And um, Dane, the floor, or I guess the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, and thank you all for joining me today. Um, um, I'd like to tell you a story about um, uh, some of the work that came out of my PhD and some of the work that was happening on the other side of the country during that time by some of my current colleagues in the Dion lab. And I'm also going to be telling you about how we can use um, the Vulcan CL uh, holder from Gatan to couple light into the microscope and out of the microscope to understand nanophotonics within the TEM. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, as many of us know, light is a ubiquitous energy resource. Uh, light from the sun, there's enough uh, delivered to the surface of the earth in a single day that we could power all of society's functional needs um, for up to a year. However, uh, humans have had a, a very difficult time being able to efficiently capture, store, and utilize solar energy for, long, for the long term. Um, despite the fact that in 2020, we're still working on this problem, um, three billion years ago, uh, photosynthetic organisms uh, in the oceans were able to capture and use uh, organic molecules as their main energy source to um, power themselves and also have uh, the creation of an oxygenated atmosphere um, on planet Earth. That atmosphere led to the evolution of land-based creatures. So uh, in this uh, picture, we have a fish crawling onto land. And in the same regard that the light that created the oxygenated atmosphere um, also led to the development of optical signal processing um, that has led to complex advanced organisms like us. Now, today we are able to efficiently capture uh, solar energy, and that's most easily seen in the form of large scale solar arrays. So the biggest solar array in the world right now happens to be in the Tangar Desert in China. It produces 1500 megawatts over an area of about 17 square miles, and that's about enough to power 120,000 average homes. But 
In addition to the ability to create and capture this huge amount of energy from the sun, uh, never, um, never uh, cut down human ingenuity, and we can also turn those solar panels arrays into pandas as well. So we can make cute structures as well as functional structures. Um, and if this isn't enough reason to put solar panels everywhere, I really don't know what is. Um, and in addition to just collecting this energy and turning it into electricity, um, I'd like to also tell you that uh, our science fiction future is going to be enabled by emerging optical technologies, controlling and utilizing light. This is most obviously seen in a few of these technologies, some of which are, are closer to market than others. Um, the first is LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR uses uh, light waves to detect nearby objects, and this is um, seen uh, where I am in Mountain View, California, in the form of self-driving cars. Um, I think they're also popping up around the country and, and the world uh, more and more frequently every day. Um, there's also optical mobile sensors that are uh, responsible for technologies such as facial recognition for opening up your phone um, and other types of uh, sensors. Uh, for example, you can use infrared light sources uh, placed onto the skin to detect um, iron levels in the blood uh, without any invasive technologies. Um, and there's also this very interesting concept of Li-Fi. Uh, this is a uh, partner to Wi-Fi, uh, however, it operates at optical frequencies rather than uh, radio frequencies. Um, and what this allows, the, what this technology will allow us to do is actually to have environments that are electromagnetically sensitive, such as hospitals or airplanes or military bases, um, be able to transmit information um, to your local devices um, just using light. But many of these advances are coming due to our new control of light at the nanoscale. And this is a slide just highlighting some of the past works in this regard. Um, and I'll spend a second or two to just go over um, what these advances have been. Um, so primarily, um, there is this idea of uh, nanophotonic lensing. So uh, today in your cell phone uh, or in your DSLR camera, um, you have these big, bulky lenses, less so in your cell phone, of course. Um, but today, scientists and engineers around the world are developing technologies that allow them to confine the optics to a flat plane and focus light within 100 nanometers to a couple of microns away from that surface. This drastically reduces focal length and can create images and um, different optical properties using these flat types of optics. In that same regard, we can uh, develop technologies and has been done several times this far, most recently by my co colleague Mark Lawrence in the Dion lab, where they can influence beam steering. So by uh, changing the, the way that um, the nanostructure interferes with light, you can actually tune the phase propagation direction of light to the left or to the right, all based on the nanoscale characteristics of the device that you fabricate. And perhaps most interestingly for the Harry Potter and the Star Trek fans out in the audience today, um, there's this idea of metamaterial cloaking. So depending on how you uh, arrange nanostructures, um, they will interact with light in a certain way that you can create uh, invisibility or blind spots. And this is uh, an idea that has been talked about for quite some time, but um, there's a lot of research going on to, in this around the world to cloak at um, infrared, radio and, and optical frequencies uh, today. I'd also like to point out um, two examples of control of light on the nanoscale from my PhD laboratory, uh, particularly in cancer therapies. Um, in 2003, uh, my PhD advisor, Naomi Hollis, uh, synthesized these gold nanoshells, um, and they're actually effective photothermal treatments for different types of cancers. Um, so the way that this works is it's injected into the bloodstream. The nanoparticles will aggregate in the vasculature that is defined by the tumor cells. Um, and then using an infrared laser, which is transparent, the skin is transparent to those wavelengths, um, you can actually heat up and selectively destroy cancer cells in this regard. And anyone who's interested in nanomedicine should uh, check out some of the latest results of the stage three trials where these uh, technologies were used for the treatment of prostate cancers. Um, and in addition to that, we have plenty of light on the planet and also plenty of salty water. Um, so being able to uh, desalinate water using some type of optical array and nanostructure is an extremely important um, technological milestone that we need to achieve in order to, uh, to get to a sustainable future. And now all of these um, examples that I've given you here 
all have to do with controlling light at the nanoscale and of course the atomic resolution structural changes that are going to occur in that regard. And that gets me to the transmission electron microscope, the tool that I'm going to be using to describe most of the work that I present today. So at Stanford, uh, we use an environmental transmission electron microscope. Um, this is a, um, a FEI, now Thermo Fisher Titan, um, and it has a gas delivery system off on the slide, off on the side, excuse me, that allows us to flow gas into the column, which is then uh, pumped away from the sample stage um, by a series of, of turbo pumps so that we can keep a, a relatively low pressure of gas near the sample, but also be able to look at the samples in the dynamic environment. So like a traditional TEM that uh, I'm sure everybody on the line is aware of, accelerated electrons are going to interact with your material of interest, um, and those electrons will pass through either to a spectrometer for electron energy loss spectroscopy, or perhaps uh, collect the x-rays for energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy, or we can pass uh, the electrons straight through to the camera. Um, but what's really unique about environmental and in situ um, microscopy is that that gas environment allows you to visualize dynamic conditions at the nanoscale. And this is also enabled by a series of uh, holder developments. So um, rather than your standard TEM holder that goes in the microscope, um, several companies around the globe are developing technologies that allow us to use heat uh, to look at thermal properties, um, electrical biasing holders, cryogenic holders, and um, the topic of today's presentation, optical illumination. So in order to couple light into the microscope, the Dione lab has been using the Vulcan CL holder. This is a uh, very simplified diagram of, um, of the geometry of that holder. Um, we use a typical three millimeter copper grid or silicon nitride grid um, that gets placed in the sample holder. Um, then there is a retractable mirror that has a concave lens both on the top and there's a fixed mirror on the bottom, which is not shown here. Um, but we slide, we place our sample in, we slide the uh, mirror over top, we screw it down, and then there's an electron aperture that allows us to probe with the electron beam uh, anything in the sample within what we call the hot spot. And so we'll have a small window on our grid that we can, we can probe uh, and try to understand um, what's happening there. Um, and then the mirror on the top and the bottom can either collect light out of the fiber optic cables that run through the body of the holder, or we can use um, fiber uh, coupled optics from a laser system, for example, um, to send light in and then focus onto the sample over an area of a few hundred microns. So um, today's presentation, I'm going to focus on two topics. So they're different than the ones that I showed before. I'm going to focus on this idea of plasmonic photocatalysis. And if you don't know what a plasmon is, I'll be describing that here in a, in a couple of slides, but essentially using light to make and break chemical bonds. Um, and then the next uh, example that I'm going to tell you about is uh, particular to the work that I've been doing at Stanford uh, for the last year or so on lanthanide dope nanophosphors. But we'll start with and spend most of our time today on the plasmonic photocatalyst uh, applications. So a plasmon is a collective resonance of electron density within a small metal nanoparticle. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this effect occurs because a light has an electric and a magnetic field component, and the electric field pushes on these, the electron density in the small metal nanoparticles to cause this oscillation. What this translates to experimentally, our measurable variable, is that at a given wavelength, there is going to be a strong signal that corresponds either to optical scattering away from that nanoparticle, so light coming in and, and being uh, scattered away um, after plasmon resonance, or um, plasmon uh, absorption. So light will uh, strike the nanoparticle and will actually be absorbed by the metal, which can lead to very interesting electronic and, and thermal effects. The biggest problem with this is that not all materials are good plasmonic metals. That's particularly reserved for copper, silver, gold, and, and a lot of my PhD work, aluminum. Um, but as you can see from this cutout of the periodic table, um, most of the materials that um, are in the iron and the platinum group metals are poor or mediocre at best. And this idea of plasmon quality is coming, uh, is being defined by something um, called a quality factor. It's essentially saying how, uh, how many times can an oscillation happen based on material properties before it's completely damped. 
you can think of it um, back to uh, basic physics as um, a damp harmonic oscillated model to try to understand how light interacts with these materials. So um, the, the concept that I came up with in my PhD was be able to be able to combine these very strong optical materials with these materials that are more traditionally known for catalysis like palladium and platinum. And so um, this gives us unique uh, capabilities to use the plasmon resonances I just showed you on the last slide to drive photocatalytic style reactions. Um, I like to say that the antenna, re antenna react effects gives us the best of both worlds. Um, in this illustration, I'm showing an aluminum nanoparticle, which is larger in size, around 90 to 100 nanometers as an effective optical antenna to collect light in the visible spectrum. And then that light is funneled into islands that are decorating the outside of the nanoparticles. And I'll talk about this for the next slide or two. So um, during my PhD work, I was able to create this library of uh, material identity um, based on the iron and the platinum group metals here. Um, and what you're looking at in the, in the far uh, left uh, corner of this array, there's a pristine aluminum nanocrystal. The, they have um, a solid metal core and also uh, you, it looks like a halo. Um, that's actually a three nanometer um, aluminum oxide layer that forms intrinsically on the surface. Um, and then on each of the other pictures, you see small black dots. Those are islands corresponding to the reactor metal decorated on the outside. Um, so I'm going to focus now just on the aluminum palladium nanocrystal and some of the uh, work that I did in collaboration with Dr. Rowan Leary at Cambridge University um, to do electron tomography on these materials. So this is a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of um, a single aluminum palladium nanoparticle. Um, and Rowan was able to parse the equivalent diameters, the nearest neighbor distances, um, and also the uh, palladium decoration density um, on an in individual nanoparticle structure. And now this is really interesting because in plasmonics, there's a uh, high field enhancements um, and there's also um, interesting electronic and photothermal effects, which I won't talk about today, um, but being able to use advanced electron microscopy to understand how these nanoscale catalysts are being um, developed is, is quite interesting. So um, now we get into the chemistry aspect of how we're using these unique aluminum palladium nanostructures to drive chemical reactions with light. Um, I focused on the acetylene, uh, I should say semi-hydrogenation reaction here. So acetylene is C2H2. You introduce some, some amount of hydrogen gas and you can either uh, make a semi-hydrogenation to ethylene. Uh, this is a very important precursor for the chemical industry. Um, the US alone produces about 25 million tons of ethylene each year. Um, and the global market value is estimated to be around $140 billion by 2026. Um, and ethylene production in the energy industry also accounts for about 30% of all energy that is used. And so this is an extremely important case study to be thinking about how light can influence these types of properties when the energy industry makes uh, inevitable shifts to more sustainable methods in the future. Um, and then if you undergo a complete hydrogenation, you can get to the C2H6 molecule, uh, which is ethane, um, and this is undesired for polymerizations. So using these aluminum palladium nanoparticles under traditional thermocatalysis, um, what I observed as I, between room temperature and 100 degrees or so um, is that the, selecti or the, the yield will continuously go up. However, the selectivity as a, as a ratio between ethylene and ethane uh, drops uh, from about four to five to one to uh, close to one to one at a certain uh, temperature point. Um, however, if the same reaction is run under photocatalytic conditions, uh, we have a very different effect and very interesting one at that. Um, in addition to a slight increase in the total yield that we observed under increasing laser power density, uh, there was also a drastic increase from about four to one, which corresponds to the dark room temperature measurement, all the way up to um, about 35 to 40 to one. So, <clears throat> excuse me, a dramatic increase in the total selectivity afforded by these processes. So that is to say that antenna reactor nanoparticles can induce chemistry that is not possible with traditional thermal approaches. And now, uh, you know, in the mylat at Rice, this was sort of the kinetics diagram that we showed. I won't go through every single step, but the most important is that um, acetylene is going to react with two equivalents of hydrogen and it's going to get to this step where we have ethylene. It can either go through a desorption-based process or if there's additional hydrogen lying around, it can undergo subsequent steps. 
And so this was uh, a quite interesting sort of uh, uh, fork in the road for us. And we, uh, in the paper, uh, explained it as, okay, we're, well, we're limiting the total hydrogen content. However, um, on the other side of the country, um, the Dione lab was working on these types of projects simultaneously to try to understand how palladium uh, interacts with hydrogen gas. And so um, this is a really interesting system because palladium will undergo reversible phase transformations between two different hydride phases. Um, in most, the rest of today's talk, I'm going to be discussing alpha phase, which is hydrogen poor, and a beta phase, which is hydrogen rich. And so um, depending on temperatures and chemical potentials of the environment and the thermodynamics, um, you can switch between these two phases. Um, and the way that this works is that you'll have undergo hydrogen splitting and absorption on the surface, diffusion into the subsurface, and then diffusion into the bulk. And so depending on the uh, interplay between each one of these steps within the chemical reaction, um, we can actually use the electron microscope to observe what's going on at the nanoscale. Um, and this can be tracked. It can be tracked in two ways, and at the end I'll introduce a third actually. Um, we can look at structural changes uh, by electron diffraction. So in a wide beam illumination in the TEM, um, we can find the diffraction pattern for the, uh, the alpha phase. And then as you undergo uh, beta phase, you'll have an expansion of the lattice and a 3.5% change in the um, diffraction pattern. And this can be uh, measured experimentally um, over large areas. Um, and we can also use um, electronic spectroscopy, particularly EELS, to do uh, STEM-based approaches where we can focus the electron beam down and probe um, sub-particle level uh, hydrogen dynamics. Um, this is shown in this uh, EELS diagram of two overlays. The alpha peak is going to occur around 7.5 EV. I don't know the exact energetics, but around there. Um, and then the beta phase, uh, as, it, as it absorbs more hydrogen, is going to go to a lower energy probability loss. And this is about a two EV shift, which can be measured. And both of these techniques um, with regards to hydrogen kinetics in the dark can be found in this series of publications um, that were published by the Dione Lab uh, while I was uh, doing my PhD at Rice. Now, um, a very interesting uh, example of sort of the synergy between um, the two labs was the development of the antenna reactor um, structure of gold and palladium on a silicon nitride TEM window um, by Dr. Mihal Vadai. And so um, she decided that she was going to probe this idea of how light can influence chemical reactivity and try to use the TEM to understand it a little bit better. So this is a simulation that shows, shows the strong electric magnetic field enhancements between the gold and the palladium. Um, and this is the experimental realization of what one of these nanostructures would look like. Now, uh, Michal uh, used, again, the, the Vulcan CL holder to couple light into the electron microscope and use the electron beam to probe the nanoscale structural dynamics under this dynamic set of conditions, both gas and laser illumination. So uh, most of the work that was done in the study was based on diffraction, but stem eels um, can also be done, as I had mentioned before. And in this experiment, um, Michal set the pressure uh, to somewhere in the intermediary between the alpha and the beta phase transition. So um, this is an isotherm shown on the right of as you increase the total pressure of hydrogen gas within the electron microscope, um, you see a change in the lattice parameter. Uh, it increases about 3.5%, as I said before. Um, and then if you drop the pressure, you can go back to the original alpha phase. And so by setting the, uh, the phase pressure somewhere in the middle, um, that sort of defines the the overall uh, geometry for this um, experimental setup. Now, uh, Michal found that there are two time scales that govern the beta to alpha phase transformation. Again, this is looking at high hydrogen concentrations going to low hydrogen concentrations on those palladium nanoparticles. And she did this using electron diffraction. So uh, there's a binary system, phase one, phase two, alpha and beta. Um, and as you turn the laser on, there's, a, there's an induction time. There's a, she found that there was a time that it takes for the reaction, the driving of hydrogen out of the system to actually occur. And then there was a, another reaction time that existed um, before there was a hydrogen poor phase. And so um, Michal was able to show that as a function of wavelength, there were uh, some interesting effects in the overall uh, induction time that it took. And that's shown down here uh, in the bottom right. 
And so off resonance, uh, there was about a 100 degree, in, uh, excuse me, a 100 second induction time that occurred um, at 570 nanometers. But as a different color light was coupled into the electron microscope, uh, Nihal observed that there was a dip at 630 nanometers and another dip at 690 nanometers, which um, led to longer induction times as, as she moved redder into the, um, the visible spectrum. Now, this corresponded very well to simulations of the electron energy loss spectra, which corresponds to two resonant features um, within this hybrid gold palladium nanostructure, seen um, as, the, as the two humps, which correspond to the dips in the induction time. But interestingly enough, uh, Nihal was able to observe that the reaction time, the amount of time that it actually took to drive hydrogen out of the system, um, did not uh, was not really influenced as a function of wavelength. And so this is a really interesting observation because it shows that unlike traditional thermal processes, um, there's a wavelength dependence to exactly how this reaction is taking place. And uh, this also corresponds to some of the results that I was able to show that we get increased selectivity, likely because we're driving hydrogen out of the system. Now, um, another interesting uh, point from this paper from Nihal was that in the dark, uh, the Beta to alpha phase transition always occurs at the corner site. So it'll uh, nucleate in the corner and then it will propagate out of the system um, to from going from pure beta to pure alpha over the period of, uh, in this case, 289 seconds, about five minutes. So there's a very slow process when you're in the dark. Uh, there's no thermodynamic input. However, when you have it coupled in this antenna reactor system, um, you get a drastic increase in the total speed, the kinetics of the chemical reaction. But we also, or they also observed rather, that there were nucleation preferences for both the corner and the edge. And the edge is defined um, sort of as shown here, that you'll have an alpha phase front that propagates along the entire um, face of this nanocube um, through the remainder of the particle. And so this was a sort of an interesting observation um, in terms of where nucleation events go and occur. Um, furthermore, they did statistical analysis on 35 total events under illumination and, and 16 events in the dark that looked at exactly where that um, dehydrogenation mechanism was going to occur. And most often they found that the corner of the palladium uh, nanotube that was closest to the uh, gold antenna, it was going to experience the highest near fields and it was going to uh, drive hydrogen out of the system preferentially. Um, so this supports the idea that increased optical absorption in these hybrid um, plasmonic and catalytic structures can activate uh, molecular orbitals and expedite um, reactions, in this particular case, hydrogen desorption. Now, um, a very talented colleague of mine, Dr. Kathleen Swaitu, who is currently looking for a postdoc for everybody on the line. She's uh, an excellent uh, lab mate and uh, great to have around. Um, she asked, how can plasmons impact structural dynamics and influence site selectivity? So basically taking that idea of nanotubes and extending it to this gold palladium nano rod cross block geometry. So uh, Catherine was able to develop these um, gold nanobars uh, with the palladium, colloidal palladium rods uh, hanging across the sides. And what this experiment was designed to do was to understand the nucleation kinetics of the beta to alpha phase transition, because it would be preferential for that, uh, that process to occur, to occur at the tips. Now, um, the structure is, was computationally studied and found that there was a, a resonant energy at about um, 675 nanometers or so, um, and that there would be high field enhancements from the gold plasmon resonance um, in the junction between the gold and the palladium. Um, so this would lend to some of these ideas that I was talking with Michal's project before. Um, in order to visualize these phase changes, Catherine uh, utilized the diffraction contraction from the, uh, or excuse me, the expansion from the beta to the uh, alpha phase. And so uh, she placed the objective aperture over the diffraction point within the electron microscope in the beta phase. Um, and as the system moved from beta to alpha, hydrogen was expelled, palladium contracted, and that diffraction point would move outside of the objective aperture and it would lose signal. And that's very important for the next few slides is that you're looking for the bright spots within the images um, as the signal for beta phase rather than the dark spots. So without illumination, um, Catherine observed that there is, uh, as, as I described before, uh, nucleation from the tips, which moves towards the center. And this makes sense based on classical nucleation theory, 
because um, edges and tips of nanostructures are going to have um, much lower under coordination, right? Um, and so without illumination, there's this, this single tip nucleation, but with resonant illumination of these nanostructures, and, and watch carefully here, um, you have central, nu uh, central nucleus, nucleation. So the beta phase is moving out from the center, uh, from the center outward, which is unexpected um, based on classical nucleation theory, and is obviously influenced by some resonant energy transfer effect from the gold nano rod itself. Um, overall, in this study, um, the, without illumination, it follows this double nucleation pattern preferentially, um, but with resonant illumination, there's two new mechanisms that have been observed. Um, single tip nucleation, where it'll drive out preferentially from one side and move completely across the nanostructure, or this middle tip nucleation, or just middle nucleation, excuse me, where you can have this high field enhancements from the palladium and push light directly out of the nanostructure. And so, um, there's, there's a lot more work in this paper uh, with regards to wavelength dependence. It's, it's currently under review, so uh, keep an eye out for that in the next coming months. Um, but of course, these novel nucleation modes exist, but within this complex parameter space of hydrogen pressure, wavelength, intensity, and so um, a lot more studying can be done in order to understand these dynamic effects of light on chemical reactions. Um, the next project I'm going to talk about from the Dialin Lab uh, is one that is ongoing and uh, was just recently submitted, and that is the role of alloys um, on light-driven catalysis. And this uh, project is being um, brought in by Daniel Angel and Riley Bourgeois. Um, they're looking at these palladium silver nanostructures, both under electron beam radiation and dark primarily, but also coupling in light to understand that process. So. Um, in this study, they're starting with the base palladium nanoparticles, um, but they're alloying in different concentrations of silver, somewhere between two and 32%. And what they've been able to show is that you can still see the lattice parameter change effects um, when you introduce hydrogen into the, um, into the microscope, uh, even with concentrations up to 14, 15% silver. Um, so again, now they're looking at these, these changes between the, the alpha and the beta phase, as a function of silver concentration. And there are changes to the overall diffraction pattern because of changes in the lattice constant. But um, they do see that the, the total change is smaller in, um, as you increase the silver concentration in total, but you can see these, these changes um, as a function of hydrogen pressure in all cases. However, um, for the next couple of slides, I'm going to be focusing on the lower concentration range because it allows for uh, much easier determination of some of these effects that we're seeing. So here, uh, rather than the beta to alpha phase transition, we're looking at hydrogen loading. So this is going from the alpha to the beta phase transformation now. And so what Daniel and Briley were able to show is that with increased uh, hydrogen pressure, there will be this change over the course of about 20 seconds. Um, and the way that they're doing most of their data analysis in this upcoming paper is looking at phase front propagation within individual nanostructures. So this is actually watching uh, phase transformations in real time. And um, I'm not going to get into uh, too much into the specific details of the physics of what's going on here. But again, I implore you to, to follow the work uh, coming out of the Dion Lab and to uh, check this out, it should be published in the next couple months or so. It has some really interesting implications for nanoscale chemistry. Um, and then uh, on the next slide, just to guide the eye, uh, they're uh, brightly developed this code where you can actually look at the overlay uh, as the stage front frozen. So um, there's a lot of information here, but I just wanted to point out uh, one specific interesting point that they were able to observe is that at some point along the, um, along the phase front uh, growth into the system, um, you'll see an increasing uh, length, but then there will be this, this redirection, this shift in the total volume and the length of that phase front, which has a lot to do with energy minimization effects inside of these nanostructures. And, and this is sort of what I was hinting at before when I said that um, there's a lot of interesting implications for how um, molecules interact with nanomaterials, um, and uh, they've been able to show that in a lot of this work. Um, They've also been working on new ways to try to understand uh, these phase transformations in real time. And so um, for most of the talk thus far, I have been talking about um, either diffraction-based imaging methods or electron uh, loss type of methods. Um, but uh, 
recently, Daniel was able to show that with high resolution TEM, you can actually do uh, uh, filtered um, transformations with FFT to collect both the alpha and the beta um, phase fronts in real time. And so looking at the high resolution image, uh, they can map out the lattice spacing within um, different uh, sections of individual nanostructures and actually get the same type of information, but at a much faster rate. Um, and a lot of this uh, sort of advance in being able to do these uh, low dose, high resolution rapid data acquisition measurements was made um, by the courtesy of Gatan lending us a, a K3IS camera for uh, the last several months. Um, and that's really uh, sort of, it's, this will be a game changer for us as we look at phase transformations um, inside the microscope, um, just because it allows us to look at large areas at high resolution um, and be able to map multiple nanoparticles at once rather than focused um, effects for the fraction or even more so with that um, yields um, type of measurement. So now, um, continuing on with the theme of the, the palladium silver nanoparticles, um, Daniel and Bradley were also able to look at the hydrogen exposure kinetics, which is catalyzed by illumination. So um, this is a sort of a dark field image of, of that process happening. This is a beta phase front moving out of the nanoparticle. You can see that there's that, that click. There's a change in the phase front reorientation, which has to do with energetics of, of the entire nanoparticle itself. Um, but the, what they were able to show that it, based in the dark and in the light, there's a, there's a distinct difference in the time that it takes for that beta phase front to completely remove itself from the nanoparticle. And uh, they were able to map this out as a function of laser power and showed that higher laser powers will influence this reaction more and more. Um, but it's kind of unknown whether this is just photothermal heating effects or whether there's some type of electronic effect that's playing a role here as well. So um, just the dark and the light uh, reaction side by side, you can see that the, the light reaction is much, much faster than the overall dark reaction. Um, and uh, even more so, there is an interesting effect with regards to the directionality of this process towards which, which tip of these uh, gold, or excuse me, palladium silver uh, plates it's going to. So they were able to show through uh, realistic modeling. So they take their uh, actual TEM images, they create a uh, size realistic model of both the corner rounding effects and the overall geometry of that structure. And they're able to run it into a electromagnetic solver and find out where the uh, highest electromagnetic field enhancements are going to occur under illumination. Um, and uh, only showing one example in this case here, um, but they've actually been able to build up some relatively good statistics that um, the Field enhancement is the driving factor for where hydrogen is going to pull itself out of this system. Um, where you experience highest field enhancements in palladium silver, um, you're going to have hydrogen expulsion preferentially, which all sort of falls into this idea as, as well with the last two projects that light can actually control where chemistry is happening on nanostructures. So um, just a brief summary and outlook on this section. Um, uh, my message to the audience today is that plasmonics can open up this new paradigm in, in light driven chemistry. Um, I showed you that uh, with the gold palladium nanostructure, um, Nihal was able to demonstrate that there's a wavelength dependence for these, for these complex bimetallic systems. Catherine was able to show that you have a selectivity in site and nucleation kinetics. And Daniel and Briley were able to show that within these palladium silver alloys, you have increased kinetics and also selectivity in the spatial uh, uh, regions where chemistry is going to occur preferentially. And so this is all work that was done by my colleagues within the Diome lab, um, but I'm particularly interested in this, these uh, new alloys that are forming. Um, some of the work from the latter half of my PhD in collaboration with um, Linan Zhao, um, was that you can have um, these alloyed nanostructures in, in this uh, nature energy example of copper ruthenium and actually do some really interesting chemistry uh, such as dry methane reforming where you take two greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, and turn that into syngas um, and particularly hydrogen as a potential um, sustainable fuel for the future. And again, this is uh, quite a large market and there's a lot of um, potential for um, these photocatalysts, particularly due to their stability and their selectivity compared to traditional thermocatalytic reactions. So um, with that, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We're no longer going to be talking about coupling light into the microscope, and rather we're going to be talking about a project that I've been spearheading over the last year 
based on lanthanide-doped nanophosphors and collecting cathodoluminescence out of the electron microscope, again, using um, the same type of uh, tools that were used before. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce this idea of immunogold staining. Um, and so, um, you know, in the last, um, I forget how many years ago it was now, but um, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for cryo-electron microscopy and, and the, uh, being able to understand um, biological structures at the nanoscale. And uh, basically the high resolution that's afforded by the electron microscope can really begin to unlock um, the ultrastructural functions of cells and proteins um, within uh, the electron microscope tool. Um, however, the sort of the current standard for labeling single proteins and trying to understand function are these small two to five nanometer gold particles that have been functionalized with antibodies, and they'll stick to the you know the outside surface of specific proteins in which that antibody corresponds. However, um, it's a contrast-based method, and so you you know the TEM will give you these black and white images, and where you see these dark dots, that's where the high Z contrast is occurring from the gold nanoparticles, but um, as we all know, cells are, you know, very complex things. There's multiple uh, integral membrane proteins that span the cell wall, different components of the individual cells, and understanding the crosstalk between this dynamic surface um, is really important to understand function and disease um, and pathology in, in some of these um, biological systems. And so over the last several years, there's been a, an idea of propagating um, within the material science, physics, and bioimaging communities of uh, correlative cathodoluminescence electron microscopy um, for uh, single protein labeling within the ultracellular context, as I, as I just said. And I stole the title of this slide from this recent review that I recommend that if you're interested in this, um, you, go, you go check this out. Um, it's a really thorough, in-depth uh, discussion about this, this technology and what it's going to take to actually achieve it. And so the idea here is that um, some type of nanoparticle probe is going to be functionalized and, and incorporated into cellular uh, structures. Um, and then you can use an electron beam um, of various energies to come in and you collect the unique optical signatures that are coming out. And if you, if you can make a sort of a library of different materials with different optical um, different optical signatures, um, then you can begin to label multiple proteins and understand um, how all these different types of proteins are interacting within the cell. So um, there are essentially two main ways that this can be uh, done. You can have uh, chemically fixed dehydrated cells that have been uh, stained and incorporated with these nanophosphors and labels. Um, you can uh, do uh, SEM on, on live cells. You can use a fib to create a cross section to look at individual uh, sections of, of a cell and use uh, cathodoluminescence, or you could integrate this into, into a fib SEM type of system where you could cut down the cell as a function of time, collect cathodoluminescence at each point in that, in that cutting series, um, and then actually be able to reconstruct whole cell images um, based on this uh, correlative cathodoluminescence uh, technique. But there are several challenges, and particularly are the development of bright and stable cathodoluminescence labels. Um, the electron beam is, is not a gentle tool, and so you need to be able to have uh, stable uh, materials within the microscope to be able to achieve this. Uh, there's also um, this challenge of multiplexing different probes for different colors to understand the dynamic uh, structural implications. Um, and there are also post-functionalization protocols um, that require um, the community to understand how um, nanoparticles are going to interact in biological environments and make sure that whatever option is come up with is sort of uh, the same um, efficiency as compared to immune gold. So uh, my solution to this was to use lanthanide doped uh, barium yttrium fluoride nanophosphors as these small CL markers. And so uh, just when I was arriving uh, in the Dione lab, uh, my colleague Stefan Fischer uh, was it, created the synthesis for these um, small alkaline earth fluorides. Um, I won't go too much into the synthesis procedure, but essentially it's a solid thermal decomposition of trifluoro, uh, trifluoroacetates. Um, and so under 300 degrees uh, Celsius, they break down. The first step is to create a small seed and then undergo subsequent shelling um, steps in order to get about a 15 nanometer edge length where um, you have a cubic structure 
and the uh, lanthanide um, dopant can replace yttrium in the cell um, and you can um, create basically a series of different um, nanoparticles based on concentration and lanthanide identity. So um, I took this synthesis and I built up a small library of 10 different varieties of barium yttrium fluoride dope nanophosphorus with each one of the uh, trivalent uh, lanthanide cations listed here at the bottom um, and just some representative in, uh, images of the final product, these, these cubic nanostructures, the, the seeds, um, and also a high resolution image um, to, to sort of demonstrate electron stability. So um, again, just to, to reiterate, we're using this, this holder, which allows us to use electron beam excitation uh, to collect light off of the sample, both on the top and the bottom mirror. And then that's focused into these collection optics, which can either go um, off into the PMT, um, for panchromatic imaging, or it can go into uh, um, uh, diffraction grading where we can collect spectra. Um, and there's a lot of observable signals when the electron beam is going to interact with your sample, uh, particularly cathodoluminescence is what we're looking at, but we can also use diffraction and eels and all of the other tools uh, inside the electron microscope to understand what's going on. Um, so Within this library I built, each one of these lanthanides is going to give us a, a unique optical signature. We have eight varieties that have uh, principal optical emissions within the visible, um, and then two varieties, uh, ytterbium doped and neodymium doped, that have uh, unique fingerprints at 900 nanometers and uh, 1,000 nanometers for um, ytterbium. Um, and so uh, this kind of shows that on the ensemble level, we're able to collect spectra um, for each one of these uh, new materials and that they each have these unique optical fingerprints. However, um, for an end goal of imaging cells and in imaging uh, single proteins, um, having ensemble spectra really isn't enough. Um, and I was able to show that we can do single particle spectra um, by uh, focusing the electron beam to a approximately one nanometer stem probe and focusing it on uh, individual nanoparticles shown by the, the red plus sign here on the HADEF images um, and collect um, spectra that, that correspond uh, extremely well, uh, minus you know, slightly higher or slightly lower signal to noise, um, but very obvious and defined cathodoluminescence spectra for these individual nanoparticles. Um, another really interesting aspect of this is the turn on, turn off ratio of cathodal luminescence, as demonstrated by uh, the line scans that I'm going to show you on this slide. So, here we're taking the small uh, probe beam, we're scanning it across the um, barium neutron fluoride nanoparticles. And what you can see is that the, the annular dark field signal uh, turns on almost precisely at the same time that the panchromatic CL total intensity counts is turning on. Uh, and this is just, uh, this is really important because other types of nanostructures and cathodoluminescence, particularly metal nanoparticles, they'll have this um, diffuse tail that, that comes away from the structure. So you'll actually collect CL signal uh, tens of nanometers away. Um, and this uh, lets us um, have this high spatial responsivity, which would be really uh, useful and important for uh, future applications as probes. Um, we can also do this with filtered cathodoluminescence. Um, in this case, the, uh, the total step size was decreased and the acquisition time was increased, um, but we can still have turn-on, turn-off ratios that correspond to um, total nanoparticle size uh, in a line scan geometry. Um, of course, the uh, stability of these particles is, is extremely important, and these are uh, representative uh, plots showing the intensity of the ensemble. Uh, here's a representative image. Um, or an image actually taken with this data uh, over the course of eight minutes. And you see that there is a drop in CL intensity, but there is still a significant portion that exists. And, and eight minutes is an extremely long time to be scanning the electron beam over and over and over across these nanoparticles. Um, this is also uh, done for a single particle, um, where over the course of two minutes, there is about a 25% decrease in the overall signal. But at the end of two minutes, uh, having constant electron pressure, um, we retain the majority of our signal. So um, sort of the, uh, the other test, so I was able to demonstrate sort of that first key point for realizing this technology. The second one is being able to do multiplex uh, spectral imaging. And so to do that, um, uh, the data I'm going to show you here is correlative panchromatic CL and EEL, so simultaneous acquisition, um, where we have a large area structure. Um, we zoom into the area in the red, that's our region of interest. We have this aggregate of nanoparticles. Um, and using uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy now, we can look at the, uh, the terbium and the holmium edges to get accurate maps of where the um, different nanophosphors are 
uh, showing up uh, inside of this mixed sample uh, TEM grid. Excuse me. And so now um, it's very obvious where the whole mainly turbulent is. However, with panchromatic CL imaging, uh, we ran into some unexpected complications, which we are uh, we are currently resolving through um, some spectral analysis tools, um, where we have. Uh, essentially signal from everywhere that nanoparticles occur. And uh, the reason I believe this is happening is because when the electron beam interacts with our nanoparticles, um, there is a, a band gap excitation of the barium yttrium fluoride host lattice itself. And barium yttrium fluoride is a very wide band gap semiconductor. It has a, a band gap of about 6.5 AV. You might not even call it a semiconductor. It's basically an insulator. And so it was really wide band gap. And upon electron beam excitation, uh, any relaxation of electron density from the conduction band edge to valence band edge is going to cause uh, UV photons to be admitted. And so that sort of uh, challenges some ideas within like defined spectral resolution using these, these lanthanide doped phosphors, which is essentially key to realizing this uh, cathod uh, correlative cathodoluminescence uh, technology. Um, however, we can get spectra at these individual particles and, and apply some weighting techniques in order to tease that out. So um, in conclusion and summary of the second section, um, I've been able to synthesize these barium yttrium fluoride uh, uh, lanthanide doped nanophosphors as small, stable, and efficient nanoprobes for bioimaging. We have about 10 different uh, nanomaterials in our library right now, which are um, on the order of what is needed to be able to couple them into um, biological systems. And despite some of these challenging uh, challenges in, in multiplex uh, spectrum imaging, um, it definitely holds uh, promise as a future material platform for these CL biomarkers, um, which does hold a lot of promise for the bioimaging community. So um, with that, I've gone a little bit over 45 minutes. Um, thank you for sticking around with me. Um, I'd like to thank the entire Dion Lab uh, at Stanford for all their uh, support over the last year, uh, especially as we've all sort of transitioned from seeing each other in the lab to working at home. Um, they've been really supportive uh, in you know, everything that's going on. Um, and then particularly, I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, postdoctoral advisor, Jen Dion, um, for her support in the lab. Um, those who I've presented their work on specifically today, uh, Michal, Daniel, Briley, Catherine, um, and also uh, Alan, who I, I didn't show his work today, but he's an integral part of the TEM subgroup here. Uh, he's currently working on uh, some of these ideas of uh, optically coupled electron microscopy, but um, within the liquid phase. Um, so that, you know, thanks to Gatan for the invitation to, to talk today. Uh, additionally, the Beck, Arnold and Mabel Beckman Foundation for their support as a postdoctoral fellow, and all of the fun, funding agencies who have been able to support this work. I'm um, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dane. That was very interesting um, results and techniques. Um, we have uh, we don't have a lot of time. Maybe a couple of questions. Um, uh, for those of you who are online, if you still have questions, please uh, submit them uh, and we will get to them, although we don't have a lot of time right now. Um, we will get back to you via email. Okay, um, so one question that was asked is you discussed how plasmas can alter chemical reactivity. Can you please explain a little bit more about how light-driven chemistry is different than conventional reactions? Sure. So um, uh, traditionally in the um, in the energy industry today, um, a lot of the reactions or the vast majority of reactions are driven by burning petroleum based products to give heat into the reaction. So if anybody has taken an organic chemistry course, you know, you use a hot plate to heat the reaction up and then you use just thermal energy input to um, make that reaction take place. But the, the really interesting aspect of why light-driven chemistry and plasmons in particular can be used for this um, regard is because you have the addition of sort of electronic effects that take place. And um, uh, so upon initial excitation of that plasmon resonance, I showed that you have that collective oscillation effect um, and the let's see if I can bring it back and the absorption and the scattering um, that exists. So particularly when there is um, light-driven absorption within a nanoparticle, as those electrons oscillate back and forth, they gain energy that's equal to the, uh, the energy of the photon that is incident. And so now you can have electronic effects 
in addition to heating effects in the system, which can lead to sort of these unique pathways that we're seeing for hydrogen activation and other activation of small molecules in bonds. Thanks, Dane. Uh, one more question, maybe the last one. Um, in the palladium hydride dark phase transformation, what is the energy source that is used to initialize the beta to alpha phase transformation? Um, let me just move to the slide real quick. So I think it is, uh, the question is referring to this uh, phase transformation and the, the dark field imaging. Um, the energy source that's being implemented here is going to be the, the light, the optics. Um, so we're coupling in a laser on resonance with this um, excitation here that was calculated about 675 nanometers. And that, um, that is going to give us this resonant illumination effect and we're able to tell what's going on um, in that system. Now, if the, if the question was, so if the question was how it's done without illumination, I believe that's done by changing the hydrogen pressure. So I, I did show a slide that showed the isotherm of alpha to beta phase transition. And by bringing the pressure back down below a critical point, you can actually switch back and forth between those individual phases. Okay, um, I think that's all we got time for today. Thanks, Dane, again for a very interesting uh, presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody for logging in. Uh, and we hope that you and your families are all safe and healthy wherever you are. Have a wonderful rest of your day.